Hi everyone. I hope that you have been well these past few weeks and that you're all safe and sound and settled into wherever it is you're spending this wild time in history. This is our first day of digital classes and this transition is new for us, so please do not hesitate to contact me with any confusion or questions or issues you might have with remote learning. <clears throat> Send me an email. No question is too big or too small. I promise I won't get annoyed. Uh, and if you have unusual circumstances at home that make this new setup particularly difficult for you, please get in touch with me. I'm happy to accommodate your situation. Like I said, this is new and unplanned for all of us. So just communicate with me and we'll figure out a setup that works for you. That said, please do make sure that you read the syllabus addendum that has been posted to our Canvas site. It explains in more detail how this course is going to work moving forward. Um, Ideally, you should do the readings for the day first, then move on to watching the lecture videos, and then finally move on to the discussion boards for last. I'll talk a little bit more about what the discussion boards are and what my expectations are later at the end of this video, but please do make sure to read that syllabus addendum and make sure that you're keeping up with all of the announcements that are posted on Canvas as well. Our text for today is the first issue or book of Batman The Dark Knight Returns. The character of Batman has been around since 1939 and has been reinvented and reimagined many times since then. This particular comic book was written by Frank Miller in 1986 during the Cold War. It is decidedly dark and violent, and though our Batman of today is a little less extreme, the idea of Batman as cool and grim really got its start with Frank Miller's take on The Dark Knight. Now, I never want to assume that you have certain knowledge coming into this course, so even though Batman is a household name, let's just quickly go over some of the basics. The superhero Batman, sometimes called the Dark Knight, is actually a billionaire named Bruce Wayne. He has no superpowers, he's just really, really rich. And he uses his wealth to arm himself with weapons and technology to fight crime in his hometown, Gotham City. He was inspired to become Batman because of the way his parents died. As we see in this first issue, Bruce Wayne's parents were shot and killed by a mugger. Because of this, Batman has two personal rules for fighting crime. He will never use guns, and he will never kill anyone. In 1940, Batman was joined by his sidekick, a kid named Dick Grayson. Dick's parents were also killed, which moved Bruce to adopt the boy. Robin eventually grows up and goes off to college and then to live his own life. Bruce Wayne somehow magically hasn't aged all that much in this time, even though Dick has become an adult, and he's still fighting crime on the streets as Batman. He gets another sidekick, another Robin, this time a kid named Jason Todd. Now what's important about Jason Todd is that while fighting crime with Batman, he is actually kidnapped and murdered by the supervillain the Joker. Now, in our particular Batman text, the death of Jason traumatizes Bruce so much that he vows never to wear his Batsuit or fight crime as Batman ever again. And this is the state that we find Bruce Wayne in at the beginning of The Dark Knight Returns. He's much older now, he's been living a normal life as a normal guy for the past 10 years. Now, there are a couple of other names that you should know. We have Superman, secret identity is Clark Kent, an all-powerful, all-American superhero, complete with those superpowers that Batman lacks. Catwoman, aka Selina Kyle, is a former thief and sometimes lover of Batman. And finally, Green Arrow. We won't see him until the very end of this book, but he's another superhero with no superpowers, and his civilian name is Oliver Queen. That's about all of the background information that you need to know. Now, before we dive into the text itself, there are two concepts that I'd like for you to keep in the back of your mind as we're reading through this book. The first concept is the elements of myth that we talked about way, way back at the beginning of the semester. Let's just review those really quickly. One element is mythic time. Mythic stories don't necessarily move linearly. A lot of times they follow a cyclical pattern, and we can already see this at play when Batman keeps replacing his Robins. First Dick, 
then Jason, and we'll get another new Robin in this book as well. The presence of the supernatural or divine is another one. Now, Batman doesn't have any superpowers, but plenty of other characters do here. Duality is another big one, and we'll talk more about Batman and Two-Face and duality with them in this issue. Myths also often promote certain social actions, telling people how to act and live. And they often give metaphoric answers to larger questions about humanity, society, and the proper order of things. Some scholars see similarities between the rise in superheroes in our pop culture today and the ancient Greek heroes of myth. As we read through The Dark Knight Returns over the next two weeks, I want you to think about why superheroes are having such a moment right now in our own present time and society. Are superheroes really the mythic heroes of our time? How so or how not? Do these kinds of heroes, super or mythic, embody certain values that our society needs or is looking for today? Keep these questions in the back of your mind as you continue reading. Now, the other concept I want us to think about is the idea of the anti-hero. Now, in the literary world, an anti-hero is simply a hero who has some unheroic qualities. A classic example of this is Holden Caulfield from The Catcher in the Rye. He's the hero of the novel, but he's not all that great, and in fact, he's pretty underwhelming. But in the world of comic books and superheroes, an anti-hero is a hero who does bad or even outright villainous things, but in the end, saves the day. Characters like Deadpool and The Punisher make great anti-heroes by this definition, and this is the definition we're going to work off of. Even in texts in this class, Berto from Ninai seems to fit the definition of an anti-hero. And of course, we talked about this idea of doing the wrong things for the right reasons when we watched the Battle of Algiers. But things are a little different with Batman. He's not fighting a war. He's not the representative of an oppressed community like the Algerians. He doesn't seem to have larger political motivations behind his actions. He's just one guy doing his own thing. As a class, most of us sided with the Algerians, even if we didn't like their methods, because they were fighting against the French, who were oppressing them. But Bruce Wayne isn't oppressed. So I think we need to rethink how we're going to judge the people who do the wrong things for the right reasons in this very new, very different context. Yes, Batman does save people in this issue but he's also very violent when he does it. His methods look a lot like what we would today might recognize as police brutality, even though he's not technically a cop. Take, for instance, this scene, when Batman is pursuing bank robbers into a construction site at night. Cornering the last of the criminals, he apparently has the time to think of seven different ways of taking the bad guy down. Three that kill, three that disarm without injury, and one that breaks the criminal's legs. Despite having three less violent options to choose from, Batman goes with the most violent, saying he's young, he'll probably walk again, justifying his use of what I would call excessive violence by saying he'll stay scared. Batman does have a personal rule that he will never kill anyone, and so far he has stuck to that. He has never crossed that line, never killed anyone. But is that enough of a line to keep him on the side of good? Is Batman a good guy here? That is, is Batman an anti-hero or is he just another villain? Now don't get me wrong, it's a lot of fun to see him beating up bad guys left and right if the purpose of heroes in fiction is pure escapist fantasy. But if the purpose of heroes in fiction is supposed to show us the kind of behavior we're supposed to emulate, we're supposed to strive for, I think he's a psychopath and I wouldn't trust him on the streets of my own city. Now Frank Miller lets us know exactly what he thinks of psychologizing academics like myself. There are two of them in the book and they are not portrayed in a very positive light at all. We meet Dr. Wolper and Dr. Willing, the men responsible for Harvey Dent's rehabilitation from his life of crime as the villain Two-Face. They continually sympathize and side with the criminals Batman puts away, and they keep getting it wrong. 
They insist that Harvey Dent is fully rehabilitated and a good citizen of Gotham again. But of course, he's not, as we see at the end of this issue. So if they're wrong in their sympathy for criminals, are they also wrong in their criticisms of Batman? What's more, is Harvey Dent's failure to change Frank Miller's way of telling us that it's impossible for people to change their inner natures? I want to take a closer look at the parallels between the stories of Batman and Two-Face. This book is about the return of Batman, sure, but it also coincides with the return of Two-Face, and it seems like the two of these characters are going on very similar journeys. Before we can get into that, though, I do want to talk a little bit about what it means to close read a comic book. We've discussed close reading texts and close reading films, and the same process still applies. In your passage or scene, look for key details and observations that seem important, analyze those observations, and come to a conclusion about why this passage or scene is important to the rest of the text as a whole. But we need to talk about what kinds of things we should be looking out for when trying to pick out key details in a scene in a comic book. Here is a list of aspects to look out for in an image. Color and light. Are there any unusual sources of light? What objects are in the light or in the shadows? How is color being used? Are colors being contrasted in a deliberate way? Size. How big are the people or objects in the image? Foreground and background. What's going on right in front of your eyes? What's going on in the background that you might not notice at first glance? Empty space. Why create an image that has so little content in it? Could the empty space symbolize something? Angle and perspective. Are we looking down on a scene? Or is there a character who is looking down on us, the readers? Position. Is the subject of the image in the center or are they off center? Are they obscured in some way? Style. Certainly in the comic book, the art style will be cartoony, but are there moments when it is more realistic, more abstract? When is the art more detailed and when is it more flat? And finally, movement and action. Is action implied in this image? How so? How does the image direct your eyes to look at a certain place? How does the image move your eyes, so to speak? Let's take a look at the very first image of Batman in the comic. In terms of size, he literally takes up the entire page and even goes outside the page. And in terms of position, he's higher up than a skyscraper, meaning that our perspective is looking up at him, or rather he's looking down on us like he's about to land on us. Batman has all of the color in this image. The background is completely unimportant. And the yellow of the bat symbol and his utility belt are especially striking. And of course, this style is very much like a cartoon. But where does the artist take care to put in more detail than anywhere else? Not the cape. It's pretty flat and without detail. But look at the small but harsh lines drawn on his torso, arms, and legs. What's the important detail added here? That Batman is muscular. Now compare this to depictions of Bruce Wayne. We'll take a look at this one, four pages into the issue. Here, he's smaller than the buildings, and he's even small within the panel itself. He doesn't even take up a quarter of the panel. The colors on him aren't all that distinguished from the background. Yes, there's a light shining on him, but you can't really see his face or any defining characteristics. And he's almost centered in the panel, but not quite as if to say that something is just a little off or off-centered with Bruce Wayne. The contrast between these images is clear, and the message couldn't be clearer. Batman is powerful and threatening. He is larger than life, and he is truly alive. All of the color in his images makes him so. On the other hand, despite being the same person as Batman, Bruce Wayne is weak and small and insecure. He is insignificant and he is not truly living. 
the tension between these two dual identities fighting inside of one person is very clear. And this tension comes to a head in the scene where Bruce Wayne flashes back to the night his parents died, about 15 pages into the first issue. Now I want to take a close look at the couple of pages this scene takes up, but I also want to point out that when close reading a comic, it's important not only to read the images, but to read the pages themselves all together as a unit. Comics are unique in that pages are an important unit of composition. Page divisions don't really matter in a text-only book, but we need to consider how all of the individual images work together on a single page to further the story. Perhaps you've noticed that throughout The Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller uses a standard 4x4 rectangle panel scheme. The book does sometimes deviate from the 4x4 panels, and when it does, it should signal to us that something important is happening. The first two pages of the flashback follow the 4x4 pattern exactly. We see Bruce Wayne in front of the TV before the panels give way to detailed memories about how his parents died. Something interesting happens on the next page. Panels depicting his parents' death are interspersed with panels of Wayne with a terrified look on his face. Then come panels of news reporters. The usual four panels are broken up into eight smaller panels, signaling Wayne's quick movements to change the channel, but bits and pieces of news of violent crimes still reach him. On the next page, we see Wayne running away in a large panel that disrupts the 4x4 scheme. But the windows of his mansion copy the usual 4x4 format. They almost look like prison bars. Batman's narration begins. The time has come. You know it in your soul. For I am your soul. You cannot escape me. Wayne jumps into the shower, as if trying to scrub himself clean of Batman. Batman calls him puny, small, and nothing. Again, panels of his parents' death pop up. The tension of his mother's pearl necklace mimics the tension of the scene. Batman tells Wayne, you cannot stop me. Finally, on the last page, the 4x4 pattern resumes. We see those prison bar-like windows again. They cast a shadow over Wayne's face, resembling the mask he wears as Batman. The final small panel is complete darkness, perhaps to signal that Bruce Wayne is erased, blank, he no longer exists. And then the final panel, wide and large, is a bat crashing through the window. We never do see the pearl necklace break and scatter. Instead, the tension of the scene is broken by the intrusion of a wild animal. And of course, when we see Batman next, he is not trapped in those 4x4 four four boxes. He takes up the whole damn page. So now, Batman is free from the prison that is Bruce Wayne. Why exactly does Batman decide to return now? Is it the rising crime rate in Gotham? Is Bruce Wayne having a midlife crisis? Is there some unfinished business he needs to take care of before he dies? Or does he return because Batman suspects that Harvey Dent is not genuine in his recovery? A small detail you might have missed is that Bruce Wayne is actually the one who paid for Dent's very expensive treatment, which included not only psychological care but also plastic surgery to fix his half-disfigured face. Perhaps Wayne, who is fighting a dual nature of his own, sympathized with Dent and his struggle with Two-Face. We should talk a little bit about who Harvey Dent is and his alter ego, Two-Face. Dent was a district attorney who had a strong sense of justice. He fought criminals, not physically, but legally, in the court system to put them behind bars. When half of his face was disfigured, he became mentally unstable and started committing crimes as Two-Face. He would flip a coin to make important decisions in his crimes. Should he let the hostages go or kill them? Flip a coin and let fate decide. In this way, Two-Face actually embodied a twisted sense of justice. What could be more quote-unquote fair than giving everyone a 50-50 chance? Let's take a look at the last page of the first issue to get a sense of the parallels between these two characters. 
Batman wants to know whether this new Two-Face is actually Harvey Dent or if it's a copycat criminal. On this page, he's disappointed to find out that it was the real Dent all along. Take a look at the eight smaller panels in the middle of the page. Dent's completely healed face is still half in shadow in these first two panels. Take a look, Dent says. Batman narrates, I close my eyes and listen. Not fooled by sight, I see him as he is. We see the true face of Dent and his inner self in the third panel, all disfigured. Apparently Dent is really all evil. The last panel shows Dent, sad and obscured in darkness. Batman's four panels parallel the four panels of Dent. The first two panels also show Batman's face, half in shadow. And then the third shows us Batman's true face of his inner self, that bat, with its oddly glowing yellow eyes and mouth. And finally, the last panel sees only Batman's silhouette, all dark. So if the dual natures of Harvey Dent were, at some point, good versus evil, what are the dual natures of Batman and Bruce Wayne? Is Bruce Wayne good, and therefore Batman is evil? Or is it a different duality? Perhaps Bruce Wayne is human, and Batman is an animal, a force of nature, a beast. Perhaps, like Two-Face's twisted sense of justice, giving everyone a 50-50 chance with the flip of a coin, Batman too has a twisted sense of justice. For me, the most alarming thing about these parallel stories of Two-Face and Batman is that Frank Miller seems to be telling us that people actually can't change themselves. People can't outrun their inner demons. And to me, that sounds a lot like fate, a concept we haven't really touched on since the Iliad and Antigone. And we'll have a lot of time to talk about Batman and figure out exactly what his fate is as we continue reading The Dark Knight Returns. We will be reading issue two for Thursday. All right, so let's talk about discussion boards. Instead of doing Zoom, I'm going to ask you to post one original post to the discussion board per class day. So that's on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And this will count as your attendance for the day. Now be sure to actually read through the directions for the discussion board post because they're going to change from day to day. You will also need to respond to others' original posts. You may have noticed that all of the journal entries and pop quizzes have been removed from our assignments and instead those points are going to be going towards participation. For each thoughtful response that you give to someone else's original post, you can earn one participation point, up to three participation points per day. For today's discussion board on March 31st, we are going to keep it simple. For your original post, please just write up a question that you think will generate a lot of thought in conversation and post it to the board. Uh, and keep in mind the themes that were discussed in the video lecture for today. Antiheroes, the use of violence, elements of myth, the duality in Two-Face and Batman's stories in this issue. Post your original post on or before March 31st at 1 p.m. and then responses to other people's original posts will be due uh, by 11.59 p.m. also on March 31st uh, in order to get your participation points. Now one thing that I want you to keep in mind, please only refer to the graphic novel in your discussion. We're not studying any of the other movies or cartoons or other comic books besides this one, so if you write a post about Christian Bale's Batman, I'm afraid I will not be able to count it. And that's it! If you have trouble with Canvas or the deadlines don't work with your situation at home, please email me and let me know. If anything goes awry, shoot me an email. And uh, to be honest, if you have any ideas or feedback on either these videos or how the discussion boards are set up, please, I am all ears. This is new for me too. So any feedback you have is welcome.
Stay well, everyone, and I will be back Thursday.